Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Joan Fontaine in The Professor on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we dramatize the first novel of one of the very greatest novelists who have ever lived, Charlotte Bronte. Its title is The Professor, and though written when she was 30, it was not published until after her death. But it's interesting not only for the signs in it of her maturing greatness, but because she later used the same material to write her more famous novel, Villette. Telling the story of a young English girl sent to a Brussels school to learn French, it touched close to the heart of Charlotte's own personal experience. And when, just over 100 years ago, she returned from Brussels to her father's parsonage to write it, she found her two sisters also writing novels. Indeed, that strange household on the Yorkshire Moors has been well described as a hotbed of genius. We are proud to tell the story of the professor and we are proud to have in the starring role that charming actress, Joan Fontaine. And now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you want to remember your friends, there's one way to be sure the card you send receives an extra welcome. Look for that identifying Hallmark on the back when you select it. For words to express your feelings and designs to express your good taste, that Hallmark on the back is your guide. Like the sterling on silver, it's a mark of distinction that all quickly recognize. And it tells your friends, you cared enough to send the very best. And now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Charlotte Bronte's The Professor, starring Joan Fontaine. In a cobbled side street in the city of Brussels, there stood a century ago a building built of grey stone, solid, severe, forbidding. Carriages seldom stopped in front of its grim portals. Yet behind that heavy oaken door, a hundred girls lived and studied and waited for their lives to begin. This was Madame Reuter's School for Gentlewomen at the beginning of the year 1840. It was the evening of New Year's Day, and Frances Henri, pupil and part-time teacher, sat in her tiny room writing the first entry in her new diary. When I was little, Mother used to tell me that what one did on New Year's Day, one would do on every day throughout the year. And so she spent the first day of the year in making me laugh and sing with happiness. Poor dear Mother, if I believed in that child's tale now, I should know myself condemned to another year of loneliness. Every morning, rising with the bell of the Church of Saint-Jacques, every day another eternity of study, and the evening, these endless hours of waiting. For what? Only another day to begin. Princess, have you seen him? Who, you lady? In the street below. He's knocking on the front door. Our door. Quickly, open your window. Hello. Hello, answer the door. Uh, monsieur, monsieur. Oh, uh, yes? This is a girl's school, monsieur. Please go. I shall call Madame Reiter. I wish you would. Tell her that Mr. Crimsworth has worn out his knuckles on her front door. Francis, he's come. He's here. Oh, it isn't possible. 
Who ever heard of an English teacher who was actually English? <laughs> uh, monsieur, perhaps if you would return tomorrow. The hour is very late. The fault is not mine, mademoiselle. The boat from England was delayed by storm. Oh, ne never mind. Someone's coming to the door. See? Madame is letting him in. And with his luggage. Oh, do you suppose he may even board with us? Perhaps the, the other teachers do. Oh, so young, so tall and thin. Not a bit like that fat Dutchman we had before. Oh, Francis, did you see his wonderful dark eyes? No, and neither did you. Oh, but I know they are. They have to be dark and wonderful. <laughs> you, Lily, if you don't mind, I'd like to be alone. See if I'm not right, Francis. Tomorrow when he comes into the classroom... Yes, you, Lily. And now, really, I have some writing to do. Writing? At a time like this, you can be so calm. Well, very well, Jerry. Good night. And a happy new year. An Englishman. Someone of my own blood. Someone who can talk to me of home. Perhaps it is only a foolish hope. But I think something wonderful has happened. understand anything that is said to you in English. Your translations are impossible, your pronunciations unbelievable, and your grammar unthinkable. Now, uh, who is next? I, monsieur. Very well. Porsche's speech from the beginning. The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. Mademoiselle. It is twice blessed. Mademoiselle. I yes, monsieur. Step forward. <gasps> to the desk, please. You have been in England? No, monsieur. You have been in English families? No, monsieur. And how is it that you speak without an accent? My mother was English. And your father? A Swiss. Then why are you not either in England or Switzerland? My parents moved to Brussels, but now they are both dead. I see. How old are you? Very well, at least too old for school. I still find things to learn, monsieur. And besides, one must live. Madame Reuter employs me to teach the girls embroidery and lace mending. Does she? And you have no ambition beyond that? I have, yes. To see England. Hmm. It is a mistake, mademoiselle, to confuse a geographical location with one's hopes and sentiments. That is all. You may return to your seat. Monsieur Crimsworth. Yes. May I also ask a question? What is it? Why are you so unhappy? <laughs> Mademoiselles, there are books for you to study, are there not? So, you think me unhappy? Yes, monsieur. For only the unhappy are rude. What is your name? Francis Henri. Then, to set your mind at ease, Mademoiselle Henri, accept my assurance that I am very happy. Completely so. How can that be, monsieur, when you are far away from England? Is your homeland so disappointing, so unkind to you that you... Mademoiselle. Forgive me, monsieur. Return to your seat at once. Yes, monsieur. I am very sorry, especially for you. <laughs> Yes, young, yes. But as you told him, France are so rude. Is it because he dislikes us so? Mademoiselle Henri. Excuse me, you lady. Would you step into the classroom a moment? <laughs> yes, monsieur. I've been thinking about what you said, uh, that is, regarding England. Yes. Your interest is natural, I suppose, since you're partly of English blood. But I presume you've had little contact with our literature. Very little, monsieur. I, uh, I brought a few books with me. Perhaps you might care to read this one. 
Morton's poetry. Oh, thank you. You you can't imagine what this means to me. I think I can, mademoiselle. Yes, I'm sure I can. <laughs> liked it, huh? Well, then perhaps you might read this history of the Tudors. I picked it up for you at one of the bookstores. Something on the English philosophers. All right, I'll see what I can find. Books can teach one only so much, monsieur. If I could know what England means to its people, what it means to you... Tell me, monsieur. Very well. But first, haven't we called each other monsieur, mademoiselle, monsieur? My first name is William. <laughs> All of heaven is not in England, Francis. There must be some lovely places, even here in Brussels. Have you no favorites? Oh, yes. The church of St. Jacques and, and the park with the stone stairway leading up to it and, and the fountain with the pigeons. Would you show them to me? Well, if Madame Reuter will give me permission. Madame Reuter. It's springtime, Francis, and I say to the devil with Madame Reuter. Yes? Who is it? Madame Reuter. Oh. I saw the light under your door, Mademoiselle Henri. You are up late tonight. Yes, I'm... I'm writing in my diary. Of course. And you have much to tell your diary this spring, have you not? <laughs> uh, may I step inside for a moment? Certainly, Madame. Thank you. I have a commission for you, Mademoiselle Henri. I wish you to make me a dress. An evening dress. But, madame, I, I teach embroidery. I, I'm not a dressmaker. <laughs> Nevertheless, you have the talent. I have here an illustration from a French periodical. You will pattern the dress after this. I shall wear it to the concert next Saturday. Oh, madame, that means within a week. I will excuse you from your duties and your studies. You will have sufficient time. Yes, madame. Good. Then tomorrow we will select the material. It, it must be of the best quality and of a color pleasing to my escort. Of course. Oh, by the way, Mademoiselle, perhaps you know Monsieur Crimsworth's favorite color? Monsieur Crimsworth? Well, does that surprise you? Oh, I forgot. You are so young, so naive. Perhaps just because Monsieur Crimsworth has helped you with your studies, lent you books, gone about with you. Oh, madame. Oh, yes, the students have reported all of this to me, and so you imagine he is attracted to you. In reality, ma chérie, he feels only pity. Oh, no. No, I don't believe you. So? You are in love with him. Yes, madame. And I think he returns my feeling. Oh, my poor innocent. You know so little of the world and the ways of men. I know that I love William, and that is enough. Is it, ma chérie? Has it never occurred to you that Monsieur Crimsworth is a most unusual young man? That he is no ordinary school teacher? That he is far above any position which I can give him here? Madame, there is nothing which you could possibly tell me that would alter my feelings. I would not be so certain of that, mademoiselle. For in reality, Crimsworth is not a school teacher at all. In England, he is a man of great wealth and position. Madame. Exactly, mademoiselle. I knew the facts when he sought employment with me. His stay here in Brussels is but a whim, an amusing episode. The sort of escapade that rich young Englishmen find so intriguing. No. No, William would have told me. Mademoiselle, I'm sure that you are not the first woman who has lost her heart to Monsieur Crimsworth. Nor will you be the last. Madame, if you intend to poison my mind, you fail. You would have me believe that Monsieur Crimsworth deceives me. But it is you who is deceived. I say it is not necessary to know very much in the world so long as one knows the truth in one's own heart. No, I shall believe in my love and not you. You will see, ma chérie. You will see. Good night, mademoiselle. Oh, it can't be true. It's not true. Oh, William, William. <laughs> In 
just a moment, we will return to the second act of The Professor, starring Joan Fontaine. Most of us have a hard time when we try to express our love for our mothers. We hardly ever get beyond the quickly stammered thank you phrases of, gee, you're a peach, Mom, or thanks, Mother, that's swell. She understands what we mean, of course, but isn't it nice to have something permanent that she can treasure through the years? That's why on one day of the year, we all like to get sentimental and tell Mother the love that is in our hearts. And that day is not far off. Two weeks from Sunday, May 11th is Mother's Day. So I thought you'd like to be reminded tonight that the new Hallmark Mother's Day cards are now at the fine stores where you regularly buy Hallmark cards. By choosing yours early, you'll be extra sure to find the one that says exactly what you want to say, the way you want to say it, to your mother. A Hallmark card will add meaning to any gift you're planning to give her because the words so beautifully express your feelings and tell of your love. And you know what your love she wants above everything else. Now back to James Hilton in the second act of The Professor, starring Joan Fontaine. The coming of the young English teacher to Madame Reuter's School for Gentlewomen gave life a new meaning to one of its students. Frances Henri had known the first joys of love, and now she was to feel the pangs of doubt and suspicion. On the Sunday following the stormy scene with Madame Reuter, Frances wandered alone through the Brussels Park where she and William Crimsworth had once strolled. Flowers, Viola, Viola. Flowers, mademoiselle. I'm sorry, madame. Of course, perhaps another time. Flowers, Frances. Frances. Monsieur Crimsworth. I hoped I might find you here, Francis. I had to see you. I've missed you in class all week. I'm flattered that you noticed my absence, monsieur. Monsieur? Francis, what's happened? Perhaps nothing, monsieur. I trust that you enjoyed the concert last evening. Concert? Why, yes, very much. But I don't understand. And Madame Reuter, did she enjoy it too? Francis. She's very attractive, don't you think? Oh, good heavens. Surely, Francis, you couldn't be jealous of her. She asked me to take her to the concert. I haven't the slightest interest in Madame Reuter. Oh? Well, I suppose, then, that you find all of us very dull here in Belgium compared to the rich young society women of London. Rich young society women? Francis, I don't know any. How is that possible, monsieur, for a man of your position and wealth? Oh. Yes, I see. Madame Reuter has told you. Yes. I should have preferred to hear from your own lips. But this is why I didn't tell you, my dear. I was afraid I would spoil everything. Monsieur Flowers for Mademoiselle? Uh, yes, yes, please. No, monsieur, really. I'll take that bunch of flowers. Yes, monsieur. Thank you, monsieur. Thank you, Flowers. Viola. Francis, I want you to believe me. These are the first flowers I've ever given to any woman. And the first... I've ever received. Oh, William. You knew what my life has been like, Francis. This is one of the few simple moments that I've known. A bunch of violets and a girl. You see, I grew up in a family whose only thought was business. The steel mill, the foundry, the shipyard. And when my father died, he left the business to my elder brother. Since then, I've been hardly more than my brother's servant. Oh, a director of the corporation, yes, but... Still a lackey. And that's why you came to Belgium. You ran away. I wanted to earn my own way, Francis. When I first came to the school, it was something of a lark. I was out to see the world. And then I met you. And now I've found all that really matters in life. Oh, William. Oh, my dearest. Yes, darling. I love you. And I you. Oh, I was so wrong to ever doubt. You mustn't, my dear. We've found our happiness and nothing can take it from us. The past doesn't matter, only the future. Monsieur, Monsieur Crimsworth. Uh, what? Madame Reuter. One of the students told me I might look for you here. You must return to this school at once. Why, madame? There is a gentleman waiting to see you. He said he is from England. William. Did he give you his name, madame? Yes, monsieur. Sir Reginald Harcraft. Oh, uh, very well. 
Madame, I'll come at once. What does this mean? I don't know, Francis. I wish I didn't have to know. Mademoiselle Henri. Yes? Monsieur Crimsworth wishes to speak to you. Would you step into my office, please? Of course. May we be alone, madame? Certainly, monsieur. William, you've, you've had bad news. My brother is very ill. Sir Reginald wants me to return to London with him. Oh, no. I don't know how long I'll be away. It depends on many things. Oh, but William... As soon as I find out how matters stand, I'll write to you. Oh, I, I'm trying so hard to understand. But don't you see, only an hour ago you said that we'd found our happiness. You seem so sure that nothing could take it away from us. But now... Francis. Oh, Francis, I'll never forget. Everything I told you, I still mean. I'll be back. Goodbye, my dearest. Goodbye, William. May 29, 1840. Three weeks since I wrote to him. And still no answer. Oh, William, if you could only find time to write just one line. The mail's come, you lady. But still nothing. You must not lose hope, Francis. Perhaps... By next week? Oh, yes. Surely by next week. How long has it been now, Mademoiselle? Five months. Five months. One week. And three days. Was I not right, ma chérie? For him it was only a passing whim. An amusing episode. December 31st, 1840. New Year's Eve and the end of this diary. I was writing my first entry the night that he came here. I looked out of the window and saw him knocking on the door below. I asked him to go away. And I shall never blame him. Our worlds were simply too far apart. A silly schoolgirl with a dream of England and love. like a terrible dream. When my brother died, all the responsibilities fell on my shoulders. The problems, the uncertainties, the decisions, everything was confused. I was confused. Oh, my poor darling. But it's all over, dearest. Now I'm away from it all. We're free. Free? But that's impossible. We're free as the winds, my dear. We can go anywhere in the world we wish. I left a power of attorney to appoint another man as head of the company. I see. Then Madame Reuter was right. Madame Reuter. All life is to you is one amusing episode after another. Francis. First you came here and played at being a teacher. You were running away from unpleasant responsibilities, but isn't life a series of responsibilities? Francis, all that matters to me is that we love each other. But I can see now that that's not enough. Don't you see, my darling, that we can't run away from responsibilities any more than we can run away from life? Francis, my dearest... There can be no happiness for either of us. As long as you are running away. There can be no happiness for me without you. Oh, my darling, say you'll marry me. If you will be by my side. Of course I will. My darling, take me home with you. Take me home to England.
Joan Fontaine and James Hilton will return in a moment. If you live in cities where This Week and Parade magazines are distributed with your newspapers, then next Sunday won't you reserve a few minutes for the children of your family? For on the back cover of these two magazines will be a story the children will probably ask you to read to them. It's the story of May baskets told in pictures and words. How May baskets originated, how the custom was brought to this country, and how children in all parts of the United States are using the new Hallmark May baskets. You'll also see the May basket story in the May issue of Ladies Home Journal and in children's activities. It demonstrates much better than I can tell you how the new Hallmark May baskets are helping children learn one of the most important lessons in life, how to be a friend. You'll probably want to see these Hallmark May baskets for yourself. You can. They're on display at all the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards. The Hallmark May baskets need no scissors or paste, and a package of five costs only 50 cents. So tomorrow, buy one or two packages for the children of your family. Then Sunday, after you've read them the story of May baskets, surprise the children with a gift from you. You'll be mighty glad you did. You can identify the Hallmark May basket package by that familiar Hallmark and crown, the same symbol of quality you always look for when you care enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Thank you for a great performance, Joan. You know, when we decided to tell Charlotte Bronte's story, The Professor, on the Hallmark Playhouse, it was quite natural that we should immediately think of you as its heroine. Can you guess why? I think I can, Jimmy, because this isn't the first time I've played a Charlotte Bronte heroine. I know. You were Jane Eyre on the screen a few years ago, and a wonderful Jane Eyre you made, too. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment, Jimmy. You always say the right thing and make a person happy, just as your Hallmark cards do. What are you having next week on Hallmark Playhouse? Next week we shall present R.D. Blackmore's classic love story, Lorna Doon. And as our star to tell us this story, we shall have David Niven. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our script tonight was adapted by Leonard St. Clair. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Joan Fontaine can currently be seen starring in the Paramount picture Something to Live For. The role of William tonight was played by Whitfield Connor, Betty Lou Gerson was Madame Reuter, and Virginia Gregg was Eulalie. You are invited to the Hallmark Hall of Fame every Sunday afternoon on television. Consult your paper for time and station. This is Frank Goss, saying goodnight to you all until next week at this same time, when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present David Niven in R.D. Blackmore's Lorna Doon, and the week following, Elizabeth Mumford's Whistler's Mother, starring Jane Wyman, and the week after that, P.C. Headley's The Marquis de Lafayette on the Hallmark Playhouse. Stay tuned for Mr. Chameleon, which will be heard over most of these stations. Transcribe tonight from Hollywood. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.